All right, this is Patrick Rogers, and today we have the privilege to have Justin Sullivan on the show. And Justin is the CEO of Ajax Jets and a number of other vertically integrated companies. Welcome to the show, Justin. Great to be here, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So Justin lives in Boston, Massachusetts with his wife, and, and Justin owns a family of private aviation businesses that manage, maintain, and charter a fleet of premium executive business jets. With over 20 years in, of experience in the industry, uh, Justin has had an interesting entrepreneurial journey that I'm sure our audience is going to be able to relate to and learn a lot from. So, Justin, before we dive into Ajax and, and your companies and your journey, what's one interesting fact that not many people know about you? After graduating from high school, I ran for mayor of my hometown, Port Townsend, Washington, um, knocked on every door in town, was a guest on David Letterman, and got 43% of the vote losing to a two-term incumbent. So I like to say that was my first ever sales campaign. Wow, that's really cool. So right out of high school, you ran for mayor. Pretty random. Before deciding to take over the private aviation world, I thought I was going to be president. Right. So, so what motivated you at, at such an er, early age to do this? It's really now, cool. I've always been somebody who's, who's wanted to do big things and... In that case, I had I've always had some some long held, you know, beliefs on on economic freedom and 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 liberty and cost of living and and what I saw in my town you know, at the, the the tender age of eighteen was um, you know practices that were contrary to my beliefs and it was being run by again a two term incumbent who I had disagreements with. Nobody ran against her and. I decided to throw my, my hat into the ring. I didn't really expect to win, but I what I expected to do was, was to illuminate some issues and to put some 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 matters on the table for discussion. Um, so it was a, I, I feel like I did my, my town a great service by by bringing those 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 matters to bear and gave this this incumbent a uh, a run for her money. It was fun. Yeah. Now, so did she end up um, improving her game or what she's been giving to the, the city since then because because of that issue or not because of because of you running and kind of did you force her to come come up stronger? Well, it, it made it a campaign, right, instead of a coronation, which was yeah. which is important. Um, I don't think anybody should run for anything on a post. But, right. you know, the punchline is, is that two years later, conditions in the town really hadn't changed. Somebody printed up a bunch of bumper stickers saying, don't blame me, I voted for Justin, Commit committee to bring Justin Sullivan home in 2000. And uh, they, they changed the town charter and, and moved to a weak mayor form of government. Awesome. Uh, it's a small cool. town in, in rural Washington state. Yeah. 10,000 people, but yeah. you know, in Southern California or, or, or Boston where I live, 10,000 people is a yeah. postage stamp. But in rural Washington, sure. it's, a, it's a real town. So how did you get on uh, Letterman? Oh, they, picked, they, they they saw an article or, or something from me and, and, and um, asked me if I wanted to be a guest. <laughs> it, was, awesome. it, was pretty, it was a pretty tough experience. You know, when I was, I, I grew up in a very strict family. I, I, uh -huh. I didn't stay up late watching TV. Yeah. So I, I hadn't watched Letterman. And, and you know, he was, a, he was a character back in 1995, right? So yeah. he... Yeah, yeah. he he put me through the ringer, to be honest with you. Um, oh, wow. He asked me some questions I'm prepared for, and, and um, it wasn't wasn't the best experience. Oh, so they didn't like give you a list of questions that they're going to ask during the interview. They just kind of like a spontaneous first, thing. First question was, Justin, so you're 18 years old. Tell me, have your testicles dropped yet? And it was like, <laughs> boop, boop, boop. You know, I, I just didn't. And it was just, it was, it was probably about a seven minute appearance. <laughs> and I just never recovered. I didn't know that, that was oh, how it was yeah. going to start. Yeah. Uh, it's a comedy show, right? That's that's pretty funny shit right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> cool, man. Well, hey, thanks for sharing that with us. That's 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 one of the best interesting facts I've had in a while. So, um, well, cool, man. So so tell us about Ajax. Tell us about your companies. What, what, do, you, what, what do you guys do, man? Sure. So it's a, it's a vertically integrated family of companies that focuses on managing, chartering, and maintaining a fleet of executive business jets. So there are a lot of things in our business model that are mm -hmm. very unique. And it really starts with owners, high net worth individuals, 
um, companies who desire to, to access private aviation on the best possible terms. And mm. what we do is, is at our core, we operate a fleet of, we call them classic executive business jets. So the oldest plane in our fleet was born in 1981. So Ronald Reagan's first term. The right. youngest being a, uh, the youngest in kind of the, the program that I'm discussing, you know, in 1994. So um, Clinton's first term. So um, a, a contrarian point of view of owning and, and operating a, a fleet of aircraft. But in so doing, we give our owners and customers and stakeholders really unique leverage points that they had never considered before. So to give you just a perspective, that early 80s, perfectly airworthy, drop-dead, gorgeous, new interior Falcon 50 costs about $2 million to acquire. Right. And that nine-seat super mid-sized jet with coast-to-coast -coast range from, can fly from Boston to San Diego nonstop, six and a half hours of range, competes with aircraft that can cost 10 times as much. So mm. we're talking about brand new Challenger 3500s or Gulfstream right. G280s. So those types of jets that a lot of CEOs, you know, in their wet dreams hope to someday achieve. Because, right. you know, really owning a private jet, accessing this category, yeah. um, it really is, is it's, it's transformational. And people, you know, executives who, who get around the country, get around the world, they all face common problems, whether you're flying mm -hmm. commercial or, or coach, I should say, or, or first class, right. it's a pain in the neck. And they, everybody desires to access the private aviation category, right. but I'll face it, $30 million for a, a brand new or, or late model Challenger super mid-sized jet, that's really unattainable for a lot of people. So they that's keep putting the can down the road right. and trying to figure out how to how can I, how can I, um, you know, someday, you know, achieve a net worth of $200 million or half a billion dollars to right. justify a $30 million jet so that I can finally be that baller. But right. what a lot of these CEOs remember is back in the day when they were on the come up in the eighties and nineties, their first private jet ride was on the CEO's Falcon or on the CEO's Hawker, you know, so, so mm -hmm. we put a new lease on life with these aircraft. And in so doing, we, we were able to operate them to a financially attractive outcome that you really can't achieve when you're trying to operationalize the, 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 the acquisition cost or the cost of capital or the debt right, service right. on a 20 to $30 million asset. So we've been doing this, operating classic jets. I've been doing it through a couple of different companies for approximately seven years. Wow. And that it really for us it starts with an owner who um who, or or somebody who's who's chartering jets looking to upgrade their experience looking to get into the into the category and that one owner who decides to invest that two million dollars or three million dollars in a beautiful classic falcon 50 mm -hmm. then you know feeds the rest of our business mm. so we I own a maintenance business called Private Jet Maintenance based in Buffalo, New York. It right. was really formed to maintain our own fleet of planes, but now provides retail maintenance and outsourced maintenance services Got to it. other aircraft owners all over the country. Yeah. And that's really not a, most people don't have the means, desire, um, wherewithal or whatever to buy a jet, right? Right. right. So they become charter customers. They're, they're people who desire to go from point A to point B safely and is to the extent possible as cost effectively as possible so bringing that new jet that new unit of supply into our fleet then creates about a five million dollar per plane business unit then mm. that million dollars just in charter revenue is all by the drip you know these are 20 30 fifty thousand dollar individual contracts to fly yeah. from yeah. New York, Las Palm Beach or wherever right, it right. happen. Yeah. So so basically, I mean, you you've created a system here and a business model that allows CEOs or anybody, obviously, 
um, that wants to get into the private airplane and, and, and executive airplane uh, aircraft, but typically they'd have to wait till you know 30 million to get to it. They can get in for two, three million, they purchase an aircraft, put it in your fleet, and now they're able to monetize that, a, a portion of it, of course, uh, at the same time still have use of their aircraft when it's not being used in the fleet. Is that right? Exactly. So okay. you know, maybe, maybe it would be helpful to just give, you know, to kind of drill deep, drill a little deeper into that. You know, most most executives, okay. most people like like when they when they dream of buying a jet, they're right. buying a that, that thirty million dollar right. jet. Right. We we'll use that's kind of a, an ongoing example. Sure. Yeah. You know, that's a, a lifestyle showpiece that has no hope of ever penciling out financially. Other than, you know, the owner's right. own time, right. Right. usage, and all that, right? And in so doing, it's it's really a, a lifestyle asset for that guy. So if, sure. he, if that owner lives in West Palm Beach. not a financial decision, yeah. That plane is based in West Palm yeah. Beach, and they're hiring it right there and hiring a West Palm Beach-based air carrier to operate it. And they always know where that jet is, right? Because right? it's, it's their most important asset, right? Think about this as a car. That's that's like buying a brand new Bentley or Rolls right. Royce, right? Right. A million dollar vehicle, right? And you're not doing that for any reason other than to scratch an itch, to yeah. um, to, to prestige, for, for whatever, sure, right, whatever. All, all, all those yeah, great yeah. things. Yeah. And it's like your 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 treatment of that asset. It, it's like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? There's probably a house built in your backyard, right? Where, garages it there's spotlights yeah, the that whole thing down on i it. got a helicopter pad you love it with the diaper, yeah. you know and when right. you drive it you you take your shoes off you you don't pick your kids up at little league in no, it no no you've got to drive from palm beach to orlando for a business meeting you you, you might take the bends because you don't want to put a thousand miles or 500 miles on on your bentley that day god bless you yeah <laughs> what we do in, in operating a fleet of, of planes from the 80s and 90s that cost two to three million dollars, right? Is it's like buying a, a 2012 G Wagon, Mercedes mm -hmm. G Wagon, mm -hmm. right? Where it's a it's a luxury automobile, yeah, yeah. It, it's a head turner, but yeah. you're paying sixty thousand dollars instead of two hundred and sixty thousand right. dollars right. for that G Wagon. Totally makes sense. Yeah. Because you want you're you're financially astute and financially motivated, and you have other things to do with your money. And you treat that that G Wagon differently than you would treat your your Bentley. Um, you're you're probably gonna drive that G Wagon for, for, for Palm Beach to Orlando because it's a pretty nice vehicle. And why wouldn't you? Because somebody right. else has taken that depreciation hit. Somebody bought it at two hundred and sixty thousand, and, yeah. and 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 appreciated it down to the sixty grand that you bought. Right. Going back to the Bentley owner, he's not going to take his car to anybody but Bentley Motors for maintenance. Right. Right. If, if ser the service A sure. light comes on, he's yeah. only going to take. You're Bentley going to Bentley Motors. only. Yeah. We're only going to use factory OEM parts. To maintain that plane or that that car for for a lot of reasons, but you know, he wants the serial numbers to match, wants to keep the mileage low, and he needs to to minimize his depreciation to the extent possible. Mm -hmm. But for that G wagon that has a hundred thousand miles on it, he's okay taking that G wagon to a uh, a luxury import repair specialist. Sure. And he's okay using non-factory OEM parts or right. at, at a minimum, he wants to have the conversation. He wants, you know, my, my guy who maintains my Benz, his name is Sparky. And we reach decision points on my car, right? Where, um, you know, the, the, the brakes need to be done. We could call these, these brakes in for Mercedes and it's going to be $15,000 or we yeah. can use non-factory OEM parts and it's going to be 7,500. What do you want to do, Justin? I, I want to use the non-factory OEM parts because I'm kind of, not, I don't drive a G-Wagon, but I'm kind yeah. of that example. Yeah, yeah. No, that right? makes sense. Sure. So in aviation, maintenance is, is one of the largest cost centers in, in what we do, right? Right. 
and in, in building a discipline and a team that has expertise in these classic airframes, we're able to, by doing things like using non-OEM parts, not bringing our planes to Dassault Falcon Jet, where a technician can bill out at $300 an hour. You know, these are technicians that we pay $80,000 a year, right? Right, right. Um, right. We, we, there's, there's a lot of leverage that we're able to offer our owners on the maintenance side. Now we'll talk briefly about the utilization. Unlike that, that challenger owner who keeps his plane at a hangar near him and it only goes in and out of West Palm Beach, mm -hmm. our planes do not live in any particular home base. I'm in Boston. Our, our flight operations department is in South Florida. Our maintenance team is in Buffalo. But our customers are all over the world. And charter customers are all over the world. Naturally, the market kind of triangulates between the West Coast, South Florida, and the Northeast. But by letting go of that, that um, train of thought, where is this jet going to be based? The jets aren't based anywhere. Jets right. are based where they dropped off their passengers yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And before they're picking up their next trip today. So if we yeah. drop off in, in Portland, and our next trip is out of Seattle, I guess our plane is based in Portland. But it takes a very special owner, Patrick, who will let that prized asset go out on the road to generate all of that charter revenue. And what we're doing, that one nuance of having our planes float in this, this big you know, orb of, of demand versus living in a home base sure. allows us to put more than 2x the number of charter hours on that plane per year. Got it. Yeah, because now it can go to different geographies and, and not out of one home base. So um, it takes that owner and that, that very unique situation where, you know, because somebody has taken, if you were to buy, again, this brand new super mid-sized jet, it's 30 million. Now we're talking two to 3 million for one of my jets. Again, somebody else has taken that depreciation hit. Right, they've so already, yeah, they drove it off the lot. Somebody else did. So, right. so, so Justin, take us through the, the, the jump, you know, going from, from a small, I think you said you started out as a small broker business. You had just a couple people uh, working with you to, to this vertical integration to take us through that journey and, and, and how, how all that evolved. I started off my career. So I, I started in tech sales straight out of college yeah. and um, a few years to that, one of my colleagues went to uh, here in the Boston area, a very large, reputable private jet company. I had never heard of the industry. I, I was in, I was very enamored with the industry. Um, right. I love geography. I like money. I like, um, I like travel. I, I, it just, it all, when I heard about it, it clicked. Yeah. And I went to go become a, a, I really talked myself into a VP of sales job with a dot-com startup in this industry. Oh. Yeah. And after a few years, I was, you know, the, the, the bulk of the business was myself, my, my own client acquisition and demand generation. So right. this is charter brokering. You, know, you don't own planes, don't manage planes. You're basically a travel agent for high net worth people and matching them with, with air, aircraft with operators. aircraft that are available. Yeah. Um, okay. After a few years of doing that, I, I was ready to I've always been very entrepreneurial I mean, from air when I was 18. So I, I've had this, this up my butt for, for a long time. Yeah. And three or four years into my career, I started my own brokerage business doing, doing just that yeah. um, and built that just one client at a time over many years to be a very attractive lifestyle business. Mm. Um, it's nothing proprietary about being a charter broker. We all have access to the same fleet. So you're really, you know, it's a lot like being a, a recruiter. You know, you're, right, you're, right. you're constantly working the supply and the demand sides of the right, equation. Sure, sure. It's, it's great. I, I, I'm still a very big... You're kind of like the middleman. Yeah. 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 And there, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Um, I, I launched a, a parallel career path whereby I was a, uh, an inside salesperson for one of these operators who kind of conceptualize this, this business model that I'm in now. 
right. of operating a distributed fleet of classic aircraft and doing it, frankly, with other people's money by selling a jet to somebody and having and, and having them operate it. So much like a uh, um, kind of like a franchise, I mean, really a lot felt felt a lot like a franchise business model. Um, I, I was there for a couple of years, and yeah. naturally, all of my clients are high net worth individuals. Sure, absolutely. So I, I have, you know, I, I started on third base because I, yeah. I, you know, I you kind of already had there. the connections, the contacts. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. They all knew, know, like, and trust me. So it, oh, yeah. it was, awesome. um, it was an easy segue to say, hey, well, you're you're spending half a million dollars a year with me on private air travel. Here's a better way of doing it, and. Um, I, I started building this this business inside another business, and you know there, there's pros and cons to doing that. So after a, a bit of time, I, I started my own entrepreneurial business, but I didn't have the license to to operate and hold out air transportation. So there's something called a, an FAA Part 135 air carrier certificate. And these are the same, it's basically the same license from the FAA that JetBlue and Delta have, which is to take money for hire for, for, for air travel. Um, and I built a business that was selling jets to people and then having um, other companies do that, that operation. So still much like a middleman, except yeah. now we're doing all the charter and demand generation and monetization and you know, paying a, a, a service provider, one of these 135 air carriers, a fee for, for, for doing that. And then the plane goes on their charter certificate. And you know, frankly, there's a lot to learn about maintenance, pilots, um, logistics, regulations. There's very steep learning curve. And you know, I think of myself as you know, an okay, smart guy, but Certainly, like I still learn something every day. And, and back in those days, you know, it was, it was a very steep learning curve, but I was was blessed to be able to do it in a way that I'm really learning from the pros of, of these these other part 135 air carriers that I was then and still do lease planes to and, and through. Right. Um, after several years of, of running my business that way. COVID happened, which was was a, a big event. COVID was initially a very scary event. It shut down our industry for a few months and then, you know, really transformed the industry for the better. And, and we're still in the golden age of private air travel because of COVID. Um, back in 2021, I raised some money from a couple clients and acquired a Part 135 air carrier that was for sale and okay. started started building the fleet that way so we, we we built bought into a business that was already going concern already had a fleet of planes wasn't necessarily doing what we're doing with having a mm. floating fleet right um, and um it was really it took me having that basis of of knowledge um to to a convince it's easier to convince somebody to buy a jet when you're saying and it's going to be managed by xyz company who's been out here for, for, for 20 years. Cause then, yeah. then, you know, it, it's a very easy value proposition. It would have been a very hard jump for me to, to make, to do that without being able to talk with the confidence and experience of having done it for, for, I guess, five years before I started. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. And so then now you have, um, how many in your fleet now? Well, in our direct Fleet, we have nine planes, and then we have we we, we that that uh, that previous business model that I mentioned of leasing planes to and through other air carriers. That's still a big part of, of what we do. So we didn't take those planes away. And one one nuance to, to our business here at, at Ajax Jets is that our our FAA certificate only allows us to operate planes that are nine seats or less. It's a nine or less charter certificate. So. Yeah. One of the cornerstones of what we do is operating 14 seat Falcon 900s. It's a very sexy, unique product. And we continue to operate those through other companies that have the, the FAA certifications to do that. Yeah, got it. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, so so talk to us about the, this whole decision that you made with the with the vertical integration. You have, you know, you have retail solutions. Um 
you have your own fleet of planes, you're, you're brokering out, you have the maintenance side of business. What's, uh, what was really, when you looked at this, what's really, I know some people, it's obvious to some people, but, but I know some of the listeners may not be as savvy perhaps with the benefits of vertical integration and really why you made that strategic decision uh, kind of early on. Well, not, not really early on, kind of late, late in the game. So I'm, I'm, you know, about a year and a half into to operating. Oh, okay, the, got it. So you know, it, it's it's still still new for for me, um, but really, it, it's a it, it, the word is control, and and w- when you're when you're reliant on other companies, there's there's things that I would 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 do differently, and when mm. you don't have operational control maintenance control, financial control, um, you really can't, can't do things the way that, that you want to do them. Um, and as, as the person, you know, I'm, I'm the, 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 the chief marketing officer really for, for my, my family of businesses. And I'm the, the, the sales executive who brought these owners in. So I want to do right by them. Uh, if somebody's making a two, $3 million investment in in my business if things don't go don't go perfectly i want to at least be able to offer my own um my own explanation um you know right or wrong for 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 why that happened and if i don't have control if my my business doesn't have control if we're 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 relying on on another service provider um not only do you leave a lot lot of money on the table but Mm -hmm. You just open yourself up to having like a di- di- disconnect with your brand versus mm. um, versus what what it it really is. So you know it's a silly example, but I'll I'll give it. It's Pilot Uniform. So one of the companies that we were working with, um, Pilot really didn't like wearing the, the 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 whole monkey suit with the 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 stripes and the white yeah. shirt and the right. the tie. And and I don't have operational control, so. I didn't even know, but I, I showed up on a ramp to do a meet and greet with customers, and my pilot showed up wearing polo shirts and 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 slacks, and and I, I didn't have any input in that. I didn't uh, know about it. it. Right, but, right. You know, it sounds so that still right. represents your company. Yes, and and it, it, there's a level of of professionalism. You know, and it, there's there's um. There's a lot, lots to unpack there, right, Patrick? Yeah, because sure. Yeah. Pilots, pilots are extremely um, finicky. You know, one I toughest bet. thing about my job is with pilots. Is that right? And they're, they're kind of like rock stars. <laughs> yeah, and they, they've got a bit of an ego. They, they have a tremendous amount of leverage yeah. because every pilot that we hire goes through our own flight safety simulator program that can cost up to fifty thousand dollars a year. Right. So once we make that fifty thousand dollar investment in a pilot, if he's not if he doesn't work out or he's not happy or um, or, or leaves, that fifty thousand dollar investment goes out the window, and we're we're short a pilot on that plane. So pilots have a lot of leverage, and if you know pilots go to their, their DO and say, hey, I, I they come on mass and say, hey, we don't we don't want to wear the, the monkey suit. I just want yeah. to get tall. I just wanted yeah. somebody to tell me. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. It, it, just one silly example of of how um you know that that wouldn't stand in in, in my company no, it doesn't yeah. stand in my company and but it, um and but it sounds like the two the two main reasons though for for vertical integration vertical integration for you was was one was control but then you also you're, you're leaving a lot of money on the table because now you have the margins um uh, that 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 you're vendors would have had you now have that in your company you get that uh, that income as well uh so what's next for you guys man what's what's next on the horizon really frankly more of the same i'm not i'm not big on on long-term goals and objectives we're okay. we're entering a period of of economic headwinds there are okay. some other some other challenges i mean not necessarily us you know but the world yeah, it's just the economy sure the, the world economy. yeah we're, we're we're fighting harder for for our revenues and and for our bookings. Um, we're trying to grow the fleet by by adding more planes, but really adding the right planes with the right ownership groups um, mm-hmm. who are motivated by the right things and having that be you know very very synergistic with 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 our existing business. 
Um, you're not going to see us double the size of our fleet. You're not going to see us get into helicopters, go to Europe. Um, you know, n- none of those big pie in the sky. Yeah, you're going to um, keep doing what you know you're good at. Yeah, this this is the the joy is in the journey. So th- this is a fun business. I, I like the people that I work with. Our whole organization has about a hundred full time employees, which really it, it grew a lot in the the very you know, in that that first year or, or year and a quarter. But each each plane that we add will will create approximately ten jobs in in our in our organization between okay. dispatch yeah. maintenance sales and we carry four pilots per plane so it's it's slow growth but but that's frankly that's fine yeah no that's awesome and you actually mentioned in our pre-call that that uh, you had an experience early in your entrepreneurial journey where you actually lost a business judgment and and it kind of resulted this whole process actually ended up resulting in you having a total mind shift around around the direction of your company you know, I'll, I'll just make myself a little vulnerable for a second. Yeah, I, I've got a very bad case of ADD, um, and I don't do any. I don't take any medications or anything uh-huh. to manage. I, I, yeah. I've, I've learned to, to manage it. But one of the the things with when you, with ADD is that you get this. It's called a shiny object syndrome, <laughs> where you see certain new shiny objects. Yeah, and most entrepreneurs have it, brother. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's well, my most entrepreneurs. That's why I, I relate so well to my clients. I, I can tell them, hey, I've got ED. And, and yeah. you'd be surprised how many CEOs will oh. tell you in confidence. So many. So many. Yeah. yeah Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, wired, we're wired the same. Um, but for for me, it's any time that I've, I've, I've pursued those those shiny objects at the expense of taking care of my, my current customers, my charter mm. customers, our owners, mm. um, having, having programs that are, are perfectly aligned um, economically, philosophically, um, logistically yeah. aligned. Right, right. Aligned with your long-term vision. Yeah. 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 And, and there, there have, I've come up with some, some pretty sexy ideas and, and concepts that frankly have have taken my eye off of that ball, you know. Earlier in my aviation career, maybe not so 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 far back in my aviation career. I mean, I, I've made mistakes. I continue to make mistakes, but I, I learn from them and and come out stronger. And, and I think for for me, what what's been very transformative in this go around and having this is a big company. It's a bit by far the biggest thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah. I don't don't know everything there is to know to this day about part 135 aircraft management or running mm-hmm. part 145 repair station. Right. Those are our two big employee centers yeah. and they're very complicated businesses. Sure. So with aviation with with the 135 air carrier, you're required by the FAA to have three they're called 119 management positions. Director of operations, who's the main man. He's the, the guy the FAA talks to. The FAA doesn't talk to me. Director of maintenance, who's got to be an AMP mechanic, and the chief pilot. Mm. Right. These are people who really run their business. Run those guys run that business. Right. Right. I'm the sales guy. I'm the promoter. Sure. The they manager. know their craft, though. You know your thing. Right. Yeah. Right. So I trust them to run that business. I trust them implicitly to run that business. And I've yeah. known them for years. Yeah. Same right. with the maintenance business. So I kind of handcuffed myself to, to doing now, doing what I do best, talking to people like you, building an audience myself, mm-hmm. marketing, promoting the business, and, and keeping things aligned. Um, and I've got people who are, frankly, a lot older and more experienced than me. I'm 45 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how old these guys are, but they're, they're a lot older than me. They got a lot more gray hair than I do. Um, <laughs> and you know that it's almost like they're my boss. They manage their manager. Right. And I respect them. I listen to them. And it's okay when they tell me that I'm full of shit and that I should re-cha- reframe my perspective on things. And sometimes I, I come up with a lot of ideas and about mm-hmm. 
60% of them maybe are good. Right. But the difference is, is that now I've got a quorum of a management team sure. who respect me and, and who I respect, but I, I probably respect them more than they respect me. Right. Yeah. And I didn't have that earlier in my career. You know, I, I've been the main man in my organization for about 15 years. Right. right. So right. that first 10 of those, I'm getting my years mixed up, but first 10 of those years, it's like being in that CEO echo chamber where it wasn't really CEO, it was a very small business, small brokerage business with a couple employees. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's nobody in the in that business to tell me that I that, that I, I need to check myself. Right. But I've got that now. And I'm blessed. You got that, yeah. You kind of almost have like your built-in uh, board of advisors almost in in specifically overall aircraft, but also in that specific area. And uh, yeah, what a fantastic thing to have. And, and that is, it is a mindset uh, shift because so, so many of us, um, you know, there's a book out there, it's called Who Not How, and, and it's all about getting those people surrounding yourself with the, with the right people versus you trying to figure it out yourself. Right. And that's, that is a, that is a huge mindset shift and humility as well. So let me ask you, Justin. So if you were going to hire a CEO to take the reins for your company, what's the one book that you'd require he or she read before taking over for you? Let me give you two books, Patrick. All right, cool. One is it's a business book. It's called 80, 20 sales and marketing by Gary Marshall. Yes. Great book. And yeah, it really earlier in my career, um, it, it, it's it was very very transformative um, because there are, are you know, the eighty twenty principle is it's a it's a law of the universe it's a it's a law of life absolutely and it, it, it's a, to, in our business now eighty percent of our revenue comes from twenty percent of our customers eighty yeah. percent of our headaches come from twenty percent twenty percent of our customers. customers right right and and you know what you can do in this business. This business marketing is really, it's micro segmenting. We micro segment our, our marketing. So we're not, we don't do big, you know, advertise in the Rob report. We market to people who we identify or who identify to us as being perfect fits into our, in whether we're trying to sell them a jet or whether we're trying to sell them, you know, a, a charter program. Right, right. Um, so by, by drilling into those 20%, we find, you know, there's there's a there's an 80 20 inside of that 80 inside of that 20. Right? So really, like four percent of your business, and if you just keep, you know, profiling those people, finding more people like those people, and and trying to build your market share inside of those people, you can you can do um, you can work a lot smarter and and not work quite as hard to acquire and 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 um, retain those those, those customers. And if you know who your 80-20 is, you know who that 20 is, mm. you know, in our business, you can, because the, the the money is so big, you can do a lot of cool things with those 20%. Mm. You can show them a lot of love. Absolutely. A, a half million dollar a year jet charter customer. Um, that's worth Justin Sullivan flying out to Aspen and pressing the flesh. Right, right, uh, right. Uh, Giving them the extra for, treatment. Absolutely. For 10 minutes of, of, of time at the airport, um, it's totally worth it. It. Yeah. For, for for Christmas, we can invest in in really nice bottles of scotch to our best customers. Sure. Uh, we we can do. We did a, a, a sunglass promotion where last quarter every every customer got a you know Paris custom prescription sunglasses worth a thousand dollars or more, right? And you can just show them so much love because if, if you you go to think if you, if you approach your business and your your, your customer base. On that 80 to 20 principle. Yeah. The next thing, completely off topic in terms of books, is yeah. um, it's called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. It's a Fantastic book, book. Uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Um, and he's a uh, he's a, a philosopher. He passed away a couple of years ago. Right. But Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life is a it's a book of translations of of the Tao Te Ching, which is the, the book of Tao. Um, otherwise known as, as Taoist philosophy, Tao, mm-hmm. um, spelled T-A-O. And um, the, the, the Tao is a book that was written by, by Lao Tzu 2,000 years before Christ. And it's a, it's a book of philosophy and extremely actionable um, principles of life wow. that everybody should, should go and practice. It, some people think of it as a religion, 
I myself am Christian, but I, I, I've incorporated Taoism into, um, into my life. So sure. if, if I have a minute, maybe I can just give your, your audience a quick example of, of what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, there's, um, so this is 81 verses, and each one of these verses in Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life has been translated and interpreted by, by Dr. Dyer. So one of them is the principle of flexibility um, and, and strength and kind of the paradox between the two. So most people, you know, when you think about strength, you think about rigidity and mm. like the big, strong, tall oak tree that, that, that can't be toppled. However, when, when the winds come, when a storm comes, if that tree doesn't bend, it's going to get toppled by, by you know, the roots are gonna, are gonna pull right out of the ground. However, if you have a palm tree, it's going to bend with the wind and it's gonna survive the storm. Similarly, when you think about a newborn baby, how flexible it is, it's, you know, it's, feet can touch its, its forehead. But when we die, what happens? Rigor mortis sets in. When a tree dies, what happens? It gets very brittle. Mm. So you can think of rigidity as being akin to death mm. and flexibility being akin to youth and vitality and vibrance. Oh, yeah. Right. And it's, it's, not, it's not just our bodies. It's our minds. It's how we, how we approach new ideas and how flexible we are with with systems and challenge challenges and and um and and the things that come out at us every every day i mean every day brings a new set of, of challenges in my business I, i'm sure some of your people can can relate so it there's there's you know the, the next paragraph is about being like water you know if you think about water and this, you know sign right here in my office is be like water um mm. water it you know, there's a great Bruce Lee um, yeah. poem yeah, about yeah. it. Like, you know, water becomes the cup. If you put yeah. it into a yeah. teapot. I forget the quote, the but yeah. yeah, exactly. You always go through the path of, of least resistance. You can't, you can't grab water. You can't attack water. Water is going to evaporate. It's going, if, if it gets too hot, it's just going to, 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 to um, reformulate as, as, as something else. Um, so, you know, there's, I get a lot out of, I mean, actually, I'm just yeah. laughing on about it, but if well, no, I there's... were to hire uh -huh. in my companies, yeah, I would want them to have the same principles Some, because yeah. it's very unique. It's a unique way of looking at things. It's a unique way of, of, of dealing with challenges. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, naturally, we all want to be around people who were, were aligned with spiritually and, and otherwise. Fantastic. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that, man. Those are those are two fantastic books. Uh, Wayne Dwyer's uh, just just foundational concepts there in that book. So highly recommend it as well. Um, so, Justin, it was great having you on the show. What, what's what's one takeaway that you'd really want the audience to absorb from our time together today? Well, you know, Patrick, we really didn't discuss it, but it's it's a, a principle that I have. It's called um, people buy programs, not proposals. Mm. So by programizing our aircraft management business, we have a program for our aircraft maintenance business, whereby aircraft owners can outsource the maintenance of their of their their asset under a, a simple program. Um, you know, that that's really been transformative for our excuse me for our business yeah. and, and 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 people so many so many times people are um when when you see a proposal you think it's just done for you and there's there's strength in, in numbers and there's strength in in um in marketing collateral and um boxes and, and graphics and other um other easy to digest marketing messages mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. all fit into programmatic type products and services versus proposal um, oriented products and services. And if I were to say, you know, my success in, in marketing and building these, these organizations up, it's been 
continually thinking about how to programize it, programize the access through programs like jet cards and fixed rate programs and memberships or owning a plane or fractional ownership and other things that um, allow my, my customer base and, and partners to feel like they're, they're part of something and they're not just buying mm. into something that was written for them much more, um, much more effective, frankly. Yeah. So really kind of sitting almost like what you're saying is, is if I'm a, somebody listening to this in any kind of a business model, really trying to take the transactional transactional aspect of the relationship out and replace it with uh, a relationship, a, a transformational relationship, if you will, where you're sitting side by side them and putting together a, a program that truly fits their needs, working with them instead of just coming at them with a proposal. Is that kind of? Yeah, I think yeah. I'll just give you an example of that. At private jet maintenance up in Buffalo, we maintain our own fleet of planes, excuse me, but we maintain other people's planes. And oftentimes those jobs are one and done. Somebody has a do list item or a discrepancy on their plane. They call us, we, we, we fix it. But, and those, those transactions are very transactional. Somebody comes in, we do a job, we right, give them an right. invoice, they plan yeah. and, and go away. Yeah. But last year we, we conceptualized an outsourced maintenance program whereby we become the outsourced director of maintenance for your aircraft. So we'll do all of the maintenance tracking. And when something comes to, it's, it's done, it, the, the work is performed by us. And you don't have to think about it. You, you, these are very sophisticated assets. There's a lot to unpack and a lot to know. Right, with right. Air so for us, we, we charge $3,500 a month for an airplane owner to outsource their maintenance to us. $3,500 sure. a month, not particularly a lot of money um, in the grand scheme of, of our business. But what we're doing is we're, we're, we're developing a very sticky relationship with that airplane owner. We're developing a more trusted relationship with that airplane owner. We're sitting on the same side of the table as our client, and we're making sure that we're getting all of that airframe yeah. maintenance, yeah, which absolutely. is you know, half a million dollars a year worth of business. So sure. just yeah. having a $3,500 program that's backed by a, a, a director of maintenance team of AMP technicians. Um, it's a full service. It, it, yeah. 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 It, it, it just really changes the game. And, cool. and awesome. awesome. Yeah. Very good, man. So, so Justin, if any of our listeners wanted to reach out and we're going to have your um, LinkedIn profile on the podcast page. So, so that part's taken care of, but if any of our listeners want to reach out and perhaps get a hold of uh, your company for services or uh, they, they to, to look into purchasing an aircraft or if they already have an aircraft that might fit your model, what would be the best way for them to get a hold of uh, you or your team? So I have a YouTube channel. It's your okay. friend with jets. Okay. Um, I have, our, our website is ajax, A-J-A-X, jets.com. And anybody can always reach me at justin at ajaxjets.com. I'm very, very responsive. Yeah. Um, fantastic having you on the show. I mean, there's so many amazing things that we talked about from, from assembling a team to the, the vertical integration, the benefits of that around the control, the margin, and, and not allowing that potential disconnect between you know, your values and the amount of service that you require. So you kind of have that control. Um, again, th thanks for being on the show, Justin. Thanks so much for having me, Patrick. It's been a blast. You bet, man. So for the audience, please hit the like and subscribe and help us spread the word about the show and what we're doing here. We're helping the next generation of leaders and CEOs be that much more successful. With that, this is Patrick Rogers, and we'll see you in the next show. Thanks a lot.